Joining me to talk about free speech in sport are two uh, professors here at the University of Michigan. To my immediate left is Dr. French, who is a lecturer in a number of units on campus, uh, LSA, English, um, engineering, psychology, and he's also a decorated veteran. And we're gonna hear his perspective uh, relative to how veterans are perceiving this notion of free speech in sport. To my further left is um, Professor Clegg, and Professor Mark Clegg is a, an associate professor in musicology, and he researches music making, and his recent projects focus on the national anthem. So we're going to talk to him about how the national anthem plays in this conversation of free speech and sport. So I want to actually begin with you, Professor Clegg. Talk to us, give us a brief history of the national anthem, and then I'm going to ask you, how did it find its way to sport events? So the National Anthem was written by uh, really a composer in a sense because it was a, always a song. So an uh, amateur um, songwriter, poet, and professional lawyer in Washington, D.C. named Francis Scott Key wrote the lyric after witnessing the Battle of Baltimore in September of 1814. So it was part of the War of 1812, sort of a second revolution, if you will, because it pitted the United States against the British again. And the British were sort of kicking our butts, you know. So they were doing really well, and we were not. And uh, I think Francis Scott Key, who had been at the Battle of Washington just a month earlier and witnessed the burning of the federal buildings, the Capitol building, and um, just a huge embarrassment for our nation, was also aboard ship in Baltimore Harbor, um, having negotiated a prisoner release from the British. And they basically said, you're gonna have to stay here while we take care of Baltimore. Should only take a few hours. And so miraculously, the United States won. And it was because of the defenders of Fort McHenry, which is the fort that guards the mouth of Baltimore Harbor. If the British had been able to go in there, they would have defeated us pretty easily. But those defenders sort of held that position against all odds. And then it was really Key's excitement, his pride, his patriotism about the heroism of those defenders that inspired him to write the song, which has now known as the Star Spangled Banner. Initially, it was titled The D Defense of Fort McHenry. So only later did it get that new title. And that title comes from that last couplet of, you know, um, just a, when it mentions the Star Spangled Banner over and over again in each verse. And that then became the title of the song. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it just sort of captured a moment in American history and, you know, was broadly distributed in newspapers. They would publish the lyrics in the newspaper and say to this sort of famous tune called Anacreon in Heaven, which started in England, actually and was the tune of an amateur musician's club. It's often thought of as a drinking song, and certainly in, you know, in 18th century England, you drank a lot because you, they had no water purification, so you either had coffee, tea, or beer, basically. So it's, it was a song that people, you know, it was about sociality, it was about men largely coming together from the middle class, but that became a popular song, and lots and lots of lyrics have been written to that same tune. I've, in my research, I found over 200 different sets of lyrics that have been sung to this tune in American history. So an important thing about what Key does is he joins a conversation about his vision for what America will be, you know, having the strong military, being able to defeat the British rather than having them come in and be able to hold towns hostage with their, you know, better firepower than we had. Um, so that's really where the song starts, and it sort of goes viral in a sense. You know, they didn't have tweets at the time, but it basically does the same thing, and it goes viral by being printed from one newspaper to the next. It eventually gets a piece of sheet music that tells people how to sing it, you know. Um, so it really just sort of becomes part of the fabric of American life, and I think it becomes the national anthem not so much because Congress passes a law in 1931, which they did, but more because people just w were singing it. Whenever the nation was in crisis, whenever there was a threat, whenever there needed to be a sense of unity, then that song was one of the things we sang. And so the Civil War was a really important marker for the song, The Star Spangled Banner. We had lots of different patriotic songs that were eventually proposed as the national anthem, everything from Yankee Doodle to America the Beautiful, Hail Columbia was really an anthem in the 19th century. But it was because of the Civil War, because that flag represented the Union, that the sonic equivalent of the flag, Francis Scott Key's song, The Star Spangled Banner, really rises to prominence. Um, the Civil War is also a pivot, an important moment in the history of the song in sports. The first time we know that the Star Spangled Banner was played at a sporting event was uh, May 15th, 1862 in Brooklyn, New York. And there was a live band, right? And it was a opening of a new, brand new ballpark in Brooklyn. And of course, the Civil War was going on. So from the very start, it's a political act to play this patriotic song in the North to support the war effort, but also to celebrate a great baseball game, to you know, celebrate the inauguration of this new park. 
And so you really have to split the history of the anthem and sports into, from a technical standpoint into two things, like before um, stadium public address systems and after. Right? So in the 1900s, if you wanted to have the anthem played or any patriotic song played, you had to hire a band. Right? You had no loudspeakers that could blast all over a sports stadium. Right? So it's not until the late 1920s, the creation of um, talkies in the movies, sort of tied to the same thing, creating these speakers that could broadcast to a large crowd, that you start having the chance to have recordings play the anthem. And of course, when you have a recording do it, you can do it all the time. You can't really do it all the time before that. So it was played at baseball games frequently, but usually only for opening day in the World Series, only for championship games. Those would be the only times you'd have the anthem really before World War I or before the 1920s. So it sounds like there's a... <clears throat> Um, implied and even expressed connection between the anthem and patriotism and sport. What makes sport this venue for patriotism? I think there are a couple things. I mean, one thing, you know, all our sporting games sort of pit two sides against each other. I mean, it's a kind of ritualized warfare. If you go back to the early days of the Olympics, it was about training, you know, Greek men to be the defenders of the populace, right? It was part of, about a kind of, you know, athletic, male, vigor, you know, and those were also your soldiers. And so there is a kind of natural connection, I think, there too. The other real reason is business reason. You know, the sport, you know, it's great if you can make your product patriotic and so that it, expressing loyalty to the country is to buy that product, right? So when you go to a sporting event, you're not only going to this game, you're actually participating in this American ritual. I mean, what's more, you know, it's like baseball, apple pie, right, is, is American. And so, and I think basketball and football are even more important now than, you know, than baseball. And so if you want to, if you want to define your, your sporting event as sort of inherently American, that the idea of consuming and purchasing a ticket is inherently patriotic and supporting the country, that's really good for business. Mm -hmm. So I think there's one moment that, that really makes that happen, which is World War I. In World War I, um, professional sports, mainly baseball, was declared a non-essential occupation. And so if you were a baseball star, and you know, usually it was a man between the age of about 18 and 30, right? So just the kind of guy you want in the military, you know, really athletic, really coordinated, all those skills of baseball would be skills you'd want someone with who was fighting on your side. A lot of those guys got you know, um, inducted into the army. And so there weren't any good players left on a lot of these teams. The teams that did well were the teams who had pitchers who were over the age of 30, you know, because they didn't get brought into the military. And so it was looking like actually the baseball season, the professional baseball season in 1919 was going to be canceled because they just didn't have enough good players to play. Um, and then, of course, the, the war ends in November of 1918, sort of saving the 1919 season. And I think at that point, baseball executives learned we, we're not going to be non-essential next time a war happens. We're going to be essential. We're going to be part of the war on the home front. So by being patriotic, by being part of the morale of the country, defined now this is essential to any war action. So when World War II came around, uh, baseball was not considered non-essential. You know? So it's really World War II is the pivot point. That's when we start playing the anthem at every single game, and particularly the National Football League. There's a, a great photo op with the president, uh, you know, Truman, and uh, um, the head of the National Football League, you know, giving him a sort of gold ticket to any game he ever wants to go to in the future. And they say, Mr. President, we're not just going to play the anthem in wartime. We're going to play the anthem all the time because it's good for our country. And of course, it was also really good for, for football. Right. So <clears throat> it, it's interesting how all the dynamics of the inherent properties in sport, how it's connected to patriotism and the, the role of the national anthem. As a veteran, um, you talk about the, the symbolic nature of, of the flag and the anthem at a sport event. As a veteran, do you, when you're at, at events, do you get that pride, besides the pride that you may get when your team is playing or winning, but talk about it from a veteran's perspective. Yeah, I think over and above whatever sort of baseline citizen pride you have, I do think it's important to consider for veterans just how deeply that culture sort of revolves around the flag. And so as was alluded to earlier, the, the idea that the sports are somehow sort of martial contests. And we talk about the linemen are in the trenches and the teams are fighting it out. And you talk about, you talk to some of the best in these sports and they really view it as a, not truly existential, but they are, they're at war with the other team and the people next to them are their friends and they bond under these very stressful physical conditions. And it's very similar to what goes on in the military. That's, mm -hmm. I think, one thing. And the other part is that um, the reverence for the flag is woven into the military culture in a very deep and profound way that starts from the beginning of their training. So 
Um, and as, as we've shifted, we haven't had a draft in so many decades, and there's such a small percentage now, less than 1%, is sort of carrying the weight of the military obligation for the country. Um, it sort of fades from sight. People don't realize the unique features of that culture. So if you were to go, um, if we could teleport magically to a Marine Corps base anywhere in the United States this morning and witness some children playing outside, let's say that the school didn't have school that day, um, at some point in the morning on every military base, uh, there is a bugle call um, that signals we're about to play the national anthem and raise the colors over the base. Every single human being outside of a building at that point, including four-year-old children, 14-year-old children, somebody walking along on crutches, whatever, will stop. They will face the flag. If they can't see the flag, they will face in whatever direction they know a flag to be, and they will stand at attention until the last note of that anthem, and then they will continue on their business. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look in the military, like the most iconic moment, for example, again, to the Marine Corps, the flag raising on Mount Suribachi, or the idea, so many of them, that you know they would literally conceive, I know, you know, luckily most of them don't have to actually make this choice, but were it a choice to put the flag back up under fire, if the flag could fall into the ground and it needed to be raised back up, knowing that there was like an 80% or 90% chance they would be killed in the attempt, they would go do it. So this issue around the flag and the respect for the flag and the flag as a representation of everything you're fighting for is really deeply woven into the military culture. And so that's the sort of the, that's the thing that's kind of getting stepped on for some veterans and, and folks that are sort of oriented towards that culture or highly respectful or knowledgeable about that culture, that's the thing that you're, you're sort of, that's the bruise that you're poking, but it isn't something that is, I think, really widely understood. Mm -hmm. So now, I'm gonna, based on that, I want to get into the crux of this, this longstanding debate about free speech in sports. So you mentioned the things that's tugging at you when you see athletes' expressions. So from your perspective, when you see athletes kneeling or, or having any other gestures during the national anthem, is that offensive to you? Do you see it as anti-American or is it their own element of patriotism? I personally think it's fantastic. I like to see it because that is the thing that's amazing to me about this country, right? That everyone has the right to express themselves and the government, you know, the, I mean, obviously the First Amendment or the sorry, Second uh, Amendment says you, you um, will not be interfered with by the government, right? But uh, in this case, it's still the same principle in that you're free to express these concerns and, and as you mentioned, use this sort of bully pulpit to bring attention to these incredibly serious issues. Um, and so I think it's fantastic. I don't find it offensive at all. Um, that said, I, I do see how others who maybe have not developed the understanding of how serious the problems that are, are being sort of raised are and also really are just focusing on hey, that's my ox being gored, right? You're showing district that this flag is important to me. Um, you, it's okay for you to raise the point, but, but you pick on something else. You use something, don't use my, you know, important symbol to, to and, uh, you know, it, they, they, have, they can have that opinion, right? I mean, I guess I understand where they're sort of coming from, but I think overall the whole, the great thing about this is that you can have these conversations. I mean, that, that to me is the difference. I've been in countries where you can't have these conversations or you don't, and it's very violent and it's very much about this expression of sort of just raw power and dominating whoever you see as sort of bad or different. It's not a good way to go. I, I like our system much better. So I think absolutely they have the right to do it and I, I think it's fantastic, right? And I think across the across the communities it's kind of mixed. If you go older on the veteran community, if you look say American Legion, I think it was just tried to do a Super Bowl ad that was very neutral plea to just say, please respect the flag and our veterans. Um, that didn't get aired because they thought it would probably be a little too controversial. Um, you know, when you look at the surveys, um, IAVA, who represents sort of the younger generation, you know, they got like a 98% thumbs up, you know, to like, yes, they, they have the right to protest, right? And this is among the younger veterans. Um, and they were like sort of two thirds um, positive on that uh, they had the right to, um, you know, specifically protest and kneel in the games and whatnot. So as the as the trends go younger, I think the more of the younger veterans um, respond less viscerally to some of the sort of, it's the flag. Uh, but um, for all veterans, there's still that sort of discomfort. But then for many, it's like, but, but that's fine because that's what the country's about. So let's have the conversation. <clears throat> so Dr. Um, Dr. Clay, from your perspective, you, you share with us the whole notion of the history, you know, the cultural biology of the national anthem. Um, you know, there are many people who have problems with the song, with the, with the lyrics. And, and so the athletes are saying, you mentioned it earlier, that the, the anthem is, is a, like a, a rallying cry that unites us. And athletes are saying there's a false sense of unity. There are things that are going on. So talk about, from your perspective, um, how you support or whether you support their expressions during the national anthem. 
Well, I definitely support their expressions, and, and part of that actually comes from the history. I mean, the song has been used as a vehicle for protest for, you know, 200 years. Um, one of my favorite lyrics that were sort of the alternate lyrics that are written to the Star Spangled Banner, the way in which the, the writing of new lyrics referring to contemporary social issues is a kind of conversation about the nation. I mean, there are lyrics about um, temperance, about women's rights, and then some of the most powerful are actually about, you know, abolition, about the end of slavery. So we have a song that was actually written in Michigan in 1844, was published in an abolitionist newspaper here in Ann Arbor called The Signal of Liberty. And it's basically calling out the fact that, you know, how can we have this song that's, that's talking about the land of the free and the home of the brave when we have so many people captive and enslaved? I mean, there's like, probably in, in 1814, there are, you know, I don't know, one, one and a half million slaves, but we get up to four million people, human beings, you know, that are forced into labor in this incredibly cruel and evil system. And in 1844, they're using the fact that Francis Scott Key's lyrics have become part of the the sense of the fabric of the nation as a symbol to call out this. The, the, one of the lines is, you know, this, the Star Spangled Banner is at the half-mast of freedom, you know, and this is not the home of the brave, but the home of the slave, you know. So they're, they're d using that irony between freedom and slavery to really send an important political message. I would even say that Francis Scott Key's original lyric, which seems so natural and true to us today, so much a part of the fabric of what it means to be American because of this repetition, you know, it was a protest too, because we had a very weak military at the time. We didn't really have a Navy. That's why we couldn't get rid of the British. They were just running up and down the Chesapeake, you know, so we couldn't do anything about it. And, you know, he's calling for that strong nation. He wants a, a country that, that has this sort of nationalist feeling. And in 1814, we're really more, you know, a bunch of different states. We weren't really a nation. And, in, and ironically, in, when Key wrote the lyric, there were more states than there were stars on the flag because the flag wasn't that important of a symbol. There's this kind of symbiotic relationship between song and flag that, the, that both make the other one more important, right? Mm -hmm. And that's grown up and been part of Eric's life in the military, which, you know, there's a you have to have a huge respect for someone who's willing to lay down their life just to have this symbol, mm -hmm. you know, stand prou proud and tall and to be a call to everyone around them and under duress, right, to stand up and to really serve the nation. And that's sort of what the song and flag do for the whole country. I mean, there are people in Florida, you know, a hurricane happens, or people in Alaska and an avalanche happens. You know, we have to have the sense of shared responsibility, right, that we will go and help someone we've never met. Don't, they're not part of our community. We've never seen them. They're not part of our family. We have to create this kind of allegiance that's going to pull people together to face an external threat, right, to want to be in the military and, and sacrifice for, for everyone at home. And that's sort of the function of, of nationalism. We, we need it. I mean, every four years when there's a new presidential election, we have to have a you know, peaceful transition of power when people realize that the country as a whole is more important than whether their candidate won or lost, right? So there, there's a real importance to the song. And I think that it's because it's been a vehicle for protest, from key to abolitionism to women's rights, because it reflects the country. And if you want to say something that everybody's going to listen to, you could, if you say it using the Star Spangled Banner, you're going to get people's attention. Sometimes you can say it about the words. We don't do that so much anymore. 20th century is more about how you perform it. You know, when you have an African-American singer singing at the inauguration of a president or singing at the Super Bowl, it says, like, this person is one of us. This person has a right to say this song, right? It's not... It's, we have to understand that, that this song is everybody's song. And then you have someone like Colin Kaepernick who says, this is a moment when all eyes are on me. Everyone's standing silently, hand over heart, standing up, looking at this flag. And if I do something different, it's going to get some attention, right? And so even though kneeling would normally be a sense of reverence, would be a sense of respect, just the fact that it's something different, just the fact that we have this moment, this ritual about being all one and, and sort of ignoring our differences, you know, Colin Kaepernick's bringing saying, well, actually, things are different. And, you know, the people who my community is not being served by the, this land of the free equally to everyone else. And, you know, I think it's not so much a protest about the song. It's using the, the ritual as a platform and calling, you know, attention to the Black Lives Matter movement, to the injustice, you know, that faces people of color in our country. And it's really that that we have to fix. And, and you, you say that that, and there's been questions about what is the that, right? Um, so to what extent, both of you, do you think the media change the narrative, reframe the narrative? Because rather than it being a protest of social injustice in America, it became a display of anti-Americanism, anti-patriotism, disrespect, disregard for the veterans. What role do you think the media played in moving this narrative? 
or do you think it played a role in moving the narrative? We definitely have some stovepipes developing, right? There is, you know, obviously it spreads across a whole continuum, but you have, you know, the sort of far right media, far left media that are really very interested in sort of pre-digesting inflammatory little nuggets and throwing them to their base and sort of getting that to flare up. And somewhere towards the middle, you still have sort of what I consider kind of like the classic original intent of, of media, which is to sort of put things out there for the popu population to sort of independently sort of process and think about. But so much of this, and so out here, absolutely, there's a there's a sort of, you want to, you know, you sort of ignore the actual main thing that's trying to be discussed and just create a little brush fire to, to sort of distract. And that, I think that's far too common and super unfortunate, right? I think and in a way that's a, that's a symbol of, or it's a symptom of a larger problem and it really feels to me like a sort of a toxin coursing through the body politic. I don't think anything can good can come from it. So, Mark, you want to add anything about the you know how you see the media's role in in this conversation? Yeah, I think that you know so much of our media scape is now driven by likes and retweets and anger. You know, whatever icon and emoji you put behind things that 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 passion and emotion is what catches fire, as, as Eric was saying. So I'd, even if the media just covered everything completely, you know, every single perspective is there, it's the ones that were inflammatory that would rise to the top. And of course, you know, the media needs that, right? It drives their economics now. People are not subscribing to newspapers. They're clicking and retweeting, and it's the advertising that's driving it. So, you know, I don't know if it's, if it's in, as much, it's partially the media's responsibility, it's partially our responsibility as consumers about how, you know, how thoughtful we are about things. So it's definitely part of the, the, the sort of ecosystem of news and information now that, that drives it, but it is easy to lose, lose the point. And, you know, I, I do think, you know, one of the challenges about any anthem is making everybody feel included. And in some ways we've got people on, you know, the far right and the far left who are both sort of left out of that feeling in some ways that the anthem and the way it's being treated anyway, you know, represents them. And that's, that's a problem. Speaking of the problem, then do we need that anthem? Do we need a new anthem? Um, what are your thoughts about that? Because there, there's lots of conversation about the lyrics in the anthem, what it's supposed to do, what it's intending to do, um, but yet the reality of what our country is and if this is a fair depiction of where our country is. So the question is, do we, do we need a new national anthem? So, I mean, I think a new national anthem would be great. I think they're hard to, how do you make one? Like, Francis Scott Key was not writing an anthem. He was marking a moment, he was responding to a moment of heroism that he thought compelled him to, to write a song. Um, there's lots of other songs that refer to the moment. Um, if one of those were to catch fire, if one of those people thought this is actually what represents us now, then it would become the new national anthem. As I said, it's not so much a law that makes it, it's really people's relationship. It's going to be hard to replace the, the Star Spangled Banner, in part because it's got a 203 year head start on everybody. Um, so it's, it's going to be hard to catch up with that. The weight of history, I mean, the fact that it was there at the Civil War and all the sacrifices that were made for the flag and all the wars we've had along the time. It, it's sort of really difficult to replace, but it's not impossible. But you're not going to be able to just, like have a contest and create a new national anthem. Well, I don't know. You teach some pretty bright students in music yeah, that's true. Yeah, so yeah. that may be a, a, a class project per se. Most countries, if they have a problem, they tweak a few words. I mean, so that's one thing. I mean, I think the real problem is the reference to hirelings and slaves, which is in the third voice, a third verse rather. Um, there's an argument that that's not actually part of the anthem to begin with. It's part of the original lyric. But in 1931, the, the bill that makes it the anthem says. The, the words and music known as the Star Spangled Banner um, is the national anthem, and the verse, third verse was cut out in World War I. So if you look at all those publications um, in, up through World War II, they don't have the third verse. It's really the internet that's brought that verse back. Um, but the reference to slavery is really problematic. It could mean a couple things. I mean, a lot of white rich people, you know, worried about being slaves of the British, um, certainly in the first revolution, and the you know, War of 1812 is sort of the second revolution. I think Key was probably being more precise, which is he was talking about the colonial Marines who were escaped African-American slaves who fought on the British side um, rather than on the American side. And they fought for their freedom, and they got their freedom, which is fantastic. But for Key, they were part of the enemy. Um, for me, the thing about the song is that um, it's not racist because there are whites and blacks fighting on both sides of the war. There are a lot more blacks on the British side than on the, on the American side. There are a few escaped slaves and a few free blacks who are fighting in Fort McHenry. So 
you know, Key's lyric really is about the good guys and the bad guys, and there are blacks and whites on both sides. So it's hard for me to read some of the stuff that's talking about you know, these really awful things that the f lyric could be about, about sort of reveling in blood of the enemy and all that stuff. I don't, I don't think it's that critical. And you know, Key himself, his relationship with slavery is bizarre because he both owned slaves and he did pro bono work to free slaves. And so we could go into the complexities of that, but, f but for me, he's, he's one of the more progressive people of that time period, which of course was a time period when the evil of slavery was legal in the United States. So it's a, it's a tricky thing to think about like Jefferson and our founding fathers and, and that, but for me, what redeems the song is what we did with it. I mean, the Civil War is about ending slavery, and that's when the song becomes important. So I, I think you know, our symbols are more about how we animate them than about where they came from. Um, so that's, that's our responsibility now, to live up to that, those ideals. And that, that, I think, is what Kaepernick's after. Right? He's after this song, not changing the song. It's not a protest of the song. It's a protest of how we're behaving in relationship to the ideals that are in the song. And we're falling short for so many people in our communities. And that's what we need to fix. Okay. I want to ask you one last question, and I'll give you both a chance to make some closing remarks. So as a veteran, you talk about the pride that you feel. If you're at a sport event and they're not playing the anthem, does that diminish the overall experience that you have? Or is it important because of the role that sport plays in the fabric of our culture that you can get that type of stimulation? So would your, would your experience be diminished if, if we didn't have the flag, if we didn't have the national anthem? As a veteran, would, would you feel like something's missing? I don't, that's a very interesting question. I, I suppose in the sense of you'd become accustomed to it, mm -hmm. then it would be noticed. I don't know, I think for me personally, it wouldn't be a matter of real concern. I, I tend to view these things um, sort of as the, you know, if I'm at this stadium, someone owns the stadium and is putting on this product, this entertainment product for me, and I'm there to see that, and their choices about what they do will then influence my willingness to purchase their product. And so um, for me personally, it's not a real strong issue. Um, if, it, if they really felt it really helped their marketing, as we mentioned earlier, then maybe they see a decrease in ticket sales or something. So, But for me personally, um, I don't think it would be that much of an issue. I, I appreciate it when it's there. Um, you know, it's every once in a while I'll be at a meeting where people stand up and still do the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm like, well, I remember this from when I was very young. But, you know, my children are not having the experience of doing that every day. So these, these cultural touchstones shift and change. I mean, I think we can recognize that in the eras past, there was a much more coherent, overwhelming almost collaboration between almost all aspects of society to say, here are the norms, here's what we do, and everything, church and the school and all the adults all reinforce this whole narrative and rules and everything. And a lot of that has been stripped away um, with, I think, some very good effects because there was a lot of there was a lot of unpleasantness that was buried within this very smooth surface where everyone was quiet. And so now with that sort of gone, some people sort of miss that, um, but I, I think there's on the net a lot of positives to it. So I think we don't have to have the, at least for me personally, and you know, I get the sense of most of the vets I've talked to, you know, the, having the anthem at a sporting event is not a game changer for them. It's, it's a routine that we do, and much as they would when they were on the base, when it's played, they show respect because it's important to them. But if they're at a baseball game or a, some other kind of game and it's not played, it's, I, I don't perceive it as sort of mandatory. Yeah. Okay. Well, you both have offered such unique insight, you know, your perspective as a veteran, your, your work on the national anthem and the Star Spangled Banner. I want to give you an opportunity now, both of you, to offer any call to action or any closing remarks uh, relative to free speech in sport. Um, I'll begin with you, um, Dr. Fretz. Okay, sure. Um, I guess I would, my, my sort of takeaway or that I would like you to think about is something I offer to my students a lot because the campus is obviously a, a place of a lot of collision of a lot of ideas. And it's, you want that collision. I just, it's so important. This is one of the greatest features about our country is that you can have this collision with adverse ideals and ideas. And, you know, sort of like as, as, um, as Mill says, you know, it's only through the collision of these adverse ideas that you ever get closer to the truth. And so this idea that you have to beat the other people somehow or, or that they're, they're evil because they have a different view, it's, uh, it's so troubling to me, right? You, you, you could look at this, let's just, let's just say we see, we see Colin Kaepernick kneeling, and you say, well, I, I'm so offended. How dare he kneel um, in the presence of, you know, whether the flag, can't he show respect? But the other flip side would be, 
here is this gentleman who is taking what he has to understand to be a very risky, personally deleterious stance in a very public way. What would be motivating someone to take this kind of risk and to and to endure the kind of censure that he's going to get from different quarters? And shouldn't that signal you that you should maybe take a look at what he's bringing forward? Because if he's willing to do this, and we somehow it sort of that sort of gets missed. And I, you know, as I say to my students, as you as you collide with all these different ideas here, just remember that different is not the same as wrong, which is not the same as evil. And when you just rock it right across that arc every time in response to anything that threatens your preset beliefs, I just think that's a that's a recipe for nothing good. And so if you really, back to the point you made earlier about just having to do this hard work of, of, of not succumbing to the stovepipes and how you're being pre-fed all these things that agree with you, actually question, oh, here's a link that, that a link to a story that confirms all of my worst fears. Let me retweet this immediately. And it turns out, of course, that it's completely fraudulent, doesn't have a bit of truth, but you don't stop yourself and say, am I being lied to for whatever reason? And how can I be a responsible contributor to this dialogue and help the people who, if you, if you see Colin Kaepernick kneeling and it doesn't get your attention that there's something wrong, like we have to, to really function as a nation, you, you've got to get to the point where you say, let me, let me understand why this is happening. I mean, maybe after I really understand it, I still just think it's, it's of no consequence, but let me at least take that as a signal to, to get in there and figure it out. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Mark? For me, um, Francis Scott Key's act of writing these words in the first place is a kind of act of citizenship. I mean, he saw a moment that he thought was heroic, that was really important for the country, and he memorialized it in a lyric to be put to a song. And I think it's important that it's a song because it carries a kind of emotion. I mean, there are those high notes in the Star Spangled Banner that we all struggle to sing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, reaching those high notes takes a lot of gusto. I mean, it takes some passion. You really have to sort of belt it out there to get there. And I think the kind of struggle that's in the music, the example of people like, you know, Francis Scott Key writing the song and then going to the, you know, newspaper office, getting it printed, distributing it to the soldiers at Fort McHenry as a kind of thanks. But also, he gave it to people who were all around the country, and then they take it with them, you know, when they, when they leave Baltimore. And so the, that sort of helps spread the word. And so he's you know, Key has started taking a, a personal responsibility. He's doing something. He sees something in the country. He wants to comment on it or change it or, you know, talk about it, and he makes something happen. And so I think that's, for me, the ultimate message of the Star Spangled Banner is that our country isn't this sacred object, you know, the song or even the flag. It's really what people do to bring those things to life. And I love the fact that a song is something you have to sing. It doesn't exist unless you're willing to make it happen. And so there's this aspect of the anthem that's about making it happen. And I think if there's a message, it's people like Steph Curry and LeBron James and Colin Kaepernick are making it happen in their way. And I think if everybody were to do that too, to follow that example, we would get across those barriers. You know, we would bring people together. We would have those kind of conversations. And, and some of those ideas would win out. And those would hopefully be those ideas that, you know, like our own country, we've, we've changed over the time. We're not the same as we were in 1814 when this song was written. And that's, that's a good thing. You know, and so the question is, what are we going to be in, you know, 3014? You know, that's really the question. It's about what these people, you know, all of us today have a responsibility for making these symbols stand for something beautiful, to stand for freedom, to stand for equality, you know, and we have to make that happen. It's not something that's, that's there forever just because the song is there, just because the flag is there. They're, they can't be empty, static things. They have to be verbs. They have to be something we do not just something we hang on a wall or put on a pole. You know, so if, if we can make patriotism an act of citizenship, I think we can get to where we want to be in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, you've given us some, some great information, um, great insight. I hope you've enjoyed this segment of our uh, conversation with Dr. Uh, Mark Clay and also Dr. Eric French on free speech and sport.